The biggest thing that changed my life about 10 years ago was when I learned to like give. No human being should ever be content. We should constantly be striving to be better people, better spouses, better parents, better siblings, better business professionals, better, better sales professionals. The actual vision board, if you like, is how many customers are happy with me today. Hi, it's Lynn Panetti here, and in this video with Rabbi Daniel Lappin, a popular American rabbi who's been a regular guest on my show before, he shares his Jewish teachings about how you can attract more money into your life. Now, the truth is God wants us all to be rich. He has given us gifts so that we can help his other children, and in return, we receive blessings from him. However, most people don't understand this. They believe that making money is maybe immoral or think that by making more, it means someone else is losing more. But this is totally not true. In this video, Rabbi Daniel Lappin will share with you the meaning of money, how to unblock your money beliefs and methods that can help you to attract more money. Hey Rabbi, so good to have you back again. Well, Lynn, I can't believe you were nice enough to invite me back again. I'm so pleased. <laughs> Of course, and I also personally bought your course and I'm going through it now and I love it so much and I just want more people to see the, you know, the, how impactful it is to go through your studies, but they're lucky enough for us to do these YouTube videos. Let's talk about how to attract more money. So Rabbi, I really wanted to explore the topic of money. I know in previous episodes that we've spoken before, we always touch on a little bit about here and there about money because obviously when we talk about business, it's got to do with money because, you know, we need to make money through business so that we could look after our family and community. But for this purpose today, I really want to deep dive more on money. How do we attract more money? Let's look up to someone right now who's not in a good space right now, right? What would be the first step or first tip then to share with people to get out of the rut? A biblical principle then is that when you're trying to change yourself, and that obviously means becoming bigger and better. It's important to first of all, start with getting rid of the negatives, abolish bad habits, abandon the things that are holding you back. And then afterwards, when you've accomplished that, you start picking up on the good things. So for instance, let's imagine, and this would be hard for you to imagine because I'm sure you can't relate to it, but there are many people who actually need to lose weight. And for them, you know, they start thinking in terms of exercising and working out. And before they do that, they should first of all, get rid of the bad habits, which are raiding the refrigerator in the middle of the night. Lose your uncontrollable yearning for chocolate cream eclairs, mm -hmm. for coconut lamingtons. <laughs> and then when you, when you stop doing all those bad things, then you can start working on the good things. Well, the thing about money that's bad is you really threw me a nice, low, easy ball there when you said attracting money, because thinking in terms of attracting money is one of the very first ideas to get rid of, to banish from your mind. One of the bad things that people do is they put up on the wall. A vision board? Yeah, right, right, right. I discourage that because generally speaking, what people have up on their vision board is a beautiful mansion, you know, and a, and a nice car, a nice boat moored in the harbor. And what this does is reinforce a huge negative and a huge obstacle to making money, which is the selfishness aspect. The only reason that I am working, the only reason I'm going to pick up the phone, the only reason I'm going to go and see a customer is so it brings me closer to what I want. And that venal aspect of personality is almost impossible to conceal from a customer. Money is not something I attract. Money is something that happens automatically in response to me solving a problem for another human being. Gotcha. And yeah. the first thing you were saying as well is number one, get rid of the negative things that you're doing with money or believing in money first, right? And I know you talk a lot about that in the course that I'm currently doing, which I really love and I recommend to people because I think also, you know, a lot of the way we, we were brought up, the news that we read, they're all negative things that causes our habit. But then your other point is also stop focusing on what you want, things that you want versus truly serving others because money is a byproduct of serving. It's the byproduct, exactly. It's the result, it's the consequence. Hey, spend your money on whatever you like. 
by all means, you should have a beautiful house and you should have a car. And I think everyone should have a boat, obviously. But, you know, you think of uh, Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, who just uh, used billions of dollars. I don't know how much exactly, but they used a lot of money to go on a, a 10 minute space journey. God bless them. Everyone has a right to use their money any way they choose and nobody else. And this is a really fundamental moral point. No other person has any right to your money. The government taxes and in a free democracy, they do so with your consent. You elect representatives who are going to set the tax code and the tax rate, and you can get them out of power if you don't like it. So as citizens, we agree that the government can tax us, but that's different from saying that anyone has a right to our money. We concede that money to government. I have an obligation. I believe in an obligation to give away 10% of my income. Let nobody knock on my door and say, hi, my name's Jim and I'm here for your 10% this month. You don't get to decide who gets it, only I do. I have to give it, but no human being has a right to my money. And that sounds selfish, but it isn't really. It's moral, because if you don't make that absolutely clear, the number of people who are then going to establish a claim on your money is almost without limit. And then you have a system where you quit working because it's just not worth it. Why don't you rather just go and lay a claim to somebody else's money? And that's why it's important to establish that so clearly. Uh, people can do what they like with their money. And the, the reason is that it comes into existence because I served another person. I solved a problem for another human being. And so what's, what's so important about understanding the nature of money is, first of all, that if you don't really wrap your entire soul around this concept, then you end up with a feeling of moral unworthiness for making money. And as any athletics coach or sports coach knows, if somebody doesn't believe they can win, they won't. Especially when you get to you know the, the Olympics going on. At the Olympic level, every athlete that makes it to the Olympics is virtually of equal physical prowess. The, the bodily power, the strength, the dedication. I mean, they've all been working at it for years. They've all reached peak. And on the day of the race, what will matter is not your muscles or what you ate for breakfast. What will matter is your heart and your soul. How hard can you push yourself? It's totally a mental and a spiritual thing. And so that's why we really got to know that if... I believe that a certain activity is morally reprehensible. Deep in my heart, I believe that something's morally reprehensible. I will never excel at that activity. And so as long as I think that money is a tangible physical object or thing or commodity or a measure, that if I've got it, I've taken it from somewhere else, anybody with any moral decency in them at all will not do well because I don't want to take money from other people. And here's the best proof that you suffer from this problem. If you have trouble, I know this isn't true for you, Lynn, but for many of our audience, if you have trouble giving your price, if you have trouble submitting an invoice, if you have trouble saying to your customer, I'd be happy to do it, that'll be uh, $47. I had somebody contact me quite recently. He wrote me an email and he said, uh, I'm working on a book that you're a bit of an expert on, and it would be very helpful for me if I could have six or seven hours of your time to advise me on how to do this. Would it be okay if I phoned you on Monday? A lot of people, when I've shared this with people, a lot of people go, oh, I don't know how to deal with those situations. It happens to me all the time. People come up and the answer was very simple. The answer is, thanks for letting me know you'll need seven hours. That will help my team prepare a proposal for you. I will send that to you by email as soon as you tell me you're ready for it. And that'll detail the nature of our engagement and the cost. And guess what? He didn't need my advice anymore. But if you feel uncomfortable naming your price, that is a good signal that you haven't yet mastered this idea. 
that you don't take money, you make it, and that the process of making money is one of the kindest things you can do to society around you. That's right. And I think for many years when I was broke, I had a lot of limiting beliefs around like money is greedy. I don't want to charge too much because it looks like I'm greedy. And it wasn't until I kind of wrote it all down. And this is why you encourage us to always journal and really write it down. Yes. And I wrote yeah. it all down and I realized like, that doesn't really make any sense. And, and also you always taught us to serve customers, serve people. Then if you're focusing on serving, then of course you're going to be adding value. And then you're going to focus on the fact that, well, I should be paid because I am serving. I'm actually adding value versus if you haven't got that thinking right, then you're going to think that you're just taking money for nothing, but you're not taking right. for nothing. That's exactly right. I mean, here's one of the uh, ways to understand that money is spiritual, not physical. By the way, let's just clarify that when I say spiritual, I don't mean holy or pious or godly or biblical or anything. Spiritual is simply the opposite of physical. Physical is any quantity that can be measured in a laboratory. Spiritual is not. And so uh, we can always measure my weight and my height, but what we cannot measure is my tenacity and my persistence and my integrity. There is no lab instrument that can measure those things. Uh, money is like that. And one of the ways of, uh, of contrasting physical and spiritual is that I can damage physical things, but I need to be right there. I can put a hammer through a car windshield, but I have to actually be there. But I can impact the value of your money without ever coming anywhere near you. If I spread rumors, the most ridiculous thing, let's say I was managed to spread a rumor in your entire economic environment, all of the place, you know, let's say you only do business in Australia, which I know you don't. I managed to persuade everyone in Australia that the world's coming to an end tomorrow. I have instantly reduced everyone's net worth to zero. And if you don't believe me, just go try and sell your house. No, there are no customers. You have nothing of any value anymore because things that are spiritual, like a reputation, can be harmed at a distance. And money can be devalued by people you don't even know who are nowhere near your bank account and nowhere near your piggy bank because money is spiritual. It's very hard to relate to, but very important. If you really are interested in changing your financial destiny, if you want to make the rest of this year a year of greater revenue than any previous year, then you really need to understand the spiritual nature of money. Yeah. And so come back to the vision board and the goals, because I think I've also kind of made a mistake that I keep on going, okay, well, I want my business to be 5 million, 10 million. It's all about the money. And versus if I reverse that into like, I want to be able to serve, you know, X amount of customers. There you go. Let me just, let me emphasize. I believe that anybody who's serious about money needs to be able to read and understand financial statements. You've got to be able to understand a profit and loss. You've got to be able to read a balance sheet. You've got to know what payables look like and what receivables look like and what a cash flow statement looks like. You really, really have to become adept at that in exactly the same way that somebody who wants to be a top rate cook, you know, needs to be able to use a scale and measure ingredients or, you know, whatever it is. Everything that you want to change requires metrics. So you absolutely, of course, you, you have to know the metrics of your business. You know, this year we were a $2 million business. We hope to be a $5 million business in 48 months. Whatever. Yeah, sure. But the actual vision board, if you like, is how many customers are happy with me today. Lovely. Oh, actually, the other point that I wanted to raise actually was around giving money. So the biggest thing that changed my life about 10 years ago was when I learned to like give you know, even when I was broke, they're like, in order to get, if you give, you will, God will just, you can never outgive the universe. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to trust this process. Like, you know, I don't have much, but I did. And the more I gave, the more, more money come back. And I know that one of your point is give beyond your means. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think a lot of people are scared of giving because they never yes. feel like they have enough money. And I can tell you, even right. people with money think they don't have enough money. It's quite appropriate to think we don't have enough. Uh, we should not be satisfied. Uh, we should be discontent. Doesn't mean we're unhappy. We have to be happy all the time. Being happy is a moral obligation. I don't have the right to inflict my misery on the people I work with or the people I live with. 
I do have to be happy, but that doesn't mean I should be content. A cow munching grass in a sunny field is content. No human being should ever be content. We should constantly be striving to be better people, better spouses, better parents, better siblings, better business professionals, better, better sales professionals, better customer service people. We should be trying to be better and better all the time. And undoubtedly, uh, money is a, uh, a way of measuring how effectively we're doing on those things. It, it's really important. I try and stress when I speak to, to young women all the time, don't let anybody call you a gold digger. It's an outrageous and insulting term for doing something which is exactly what you should do, which is find out all you can about the guy you're dating's finances. You'd be so stupid not to do that because a man's money tells you a whole lot more than just his balance sheet. It tells you about his persistence because usually you don't make money jumping from one thing to another. And it tells you whether he can focus on the vision. You know, some of the, the biggest tech millionaires or billionaires of, of the last two decades are people who will tell you they started their businesses not caring about the money. They were, they were driven by the enthusiasm of creating a, an app or software or hardware that'll change people's lives. That's what they were doing. The money flows by itself. That's really, really important to understand. When we, we speak about understanding the nature of money, um, it tells us a whole lot. And so when I, I say that a woman should have a very good look at a man's finances, you know, if he has debt, it's important for you to know. That tells you something. If he does have money, it'll tell you that uh, he's able to retain relationships with other people because you can't make money in isolation. And so I don't care how good looking he is. And I don't care, uh, you know, what a bad boy he is and, and how much confidence he exudes and how sexy he is. If he doesn't have money, don't waste your time with him. Yes. I guess the note to take though is depending where he got his money because you do know that there are some men that maybe inherited it and then he's a brat. So back to my question about giving, giving. How do yes. you get people to be more comfortable with giving? You know, it's like saying, how do you get people to be more comfortable with eating healthily and exercising? Uh, you can't make other people do anything, you know. But what you can do is evangelize, if you like. You can share how well it's working for you. Hey, you know, I'm not trying to force you to take my diet, but I'm just telling you I've never felt healthier. And then the person will tell me, what are you eating? Okay, now, once you start asking me, we're on our way. If if I say, uh, you know, somebody, I, I got asked in an interview recently, are you happy? That's a really good question. And one of the reasons is because giving makes me happy. People think spending makes you happy, but spending is more like a drug called retail therapy. It's just a drug and you buy stuff and you feel happy for a while. When you come down from the high, it's really, really unpleasant. Um, giving is not like that. Uh, giving is an enduring high. Now, why does it work? You know, you, you said that things started going better for you. Well, the way that God built this world, you have to give before you get. It's as simple as that. You've got to give before you get. You want to have children and have pleasure from them? Sure, but you'll have a good few years where all you're doing is giving and getting nothing back. The world is a place where things go better if you give before you get. When a business extends credit to somebody, that's giving. It happens all the time. And, and nine times out of 10, you know, when you go and buy something, you buy a pair of shoes, when the transaction is complete, the salesman puts it in your hands or puts it in front of you, and then you pay him. Like when last were you in a store where the person held onto the thing and said, the money, it, that's not how <laughs> You'll say, you know what? I don't need to shop here. I'll go somewhere else. Because we all deeply understand the principle of giving before you get. 10% giving charity is, is very much how that works. And, and here's the best part of it, Lynn. I don't know if you've ever been to one of these events. They call them uh, business clubs or different kinds of names where once a month, like the, the first Tuesday of every month, everyone gets together for breakfast. Yes. And they 
these business cards. BNI, so- it's called um, business networking. Blah, blah. Anyway, there are these yeah. similar ones that yeah. go around the world. Yeah. So my my advice is do not waste your time doing that because when you hang around selfish people, nothing good comes of that. And I'm not saying people at the BNI business uh, network, selfish, horrible people. They're not. They're all lovely people, but they're all focused on what they need and what they can get. As in what referrals can you give me and what? Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. Exactly. Whereas I'll tell you where a lot of business is done, and that is at civic clubs called Rotary. A lot of business happens there. You know why? Because the only reason they get together every week is to do good for this community. If I am looking for, let's say I need a plumber, I'm going to look not for a selfish plumber, but for a plumber who cares. Where Mm -hmm. am I going to find him? Not at a business networking group. I'm going to find a plumber who cares at Rotary, you know, or maybe at, uh, at, at some church benefit. That's where I'm going to find that person. And this is not a cynical take on it. I sort of feel an, a need to, uh, to, to give that preamble. But giving is one of the best ways of getting to meet other large giving human beings. You surround yourself with just other generous people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I really love the power of giving because there's two things. One is it makes you feel really good at last. Other people might reciprocate. They just want to help you back and because you give to them. But the third one, which really surprised me, and I go, oh, my God, there is a God out there, is when things come out of nowhere. You know, you might give yes. some things over there, but all of a sudden you receive a check in the mail from some yeah. random place. How, why does that work and how does that work? How come God is so interesting in that? Yeah, one? well, there are different where people use the word karma, right? <laughs> to to try and describe that. But yes, when you are in a state of unity with every aspect of your life, and you know that I teach that this means unity with your family, with your friends, with your physical fitness, with your body, with your finances, and with your faith, being in a state of cosmic balance like that just means that things are drawn to you. In physics, we call it gravity. Now, nobody really understands exactly what gravity is. We can define it and we can uh, measure it, but I'll tell you what gravity really means. And that means that any two objects near each other feel a pull towards one another. Now, in what we're mostly accustomed to are two very big objects like the Earth and the Moon, and tides flow in the harbor because the attraction that the body of water feels towards the moon. But this is an amazing reality. If we were in outer space and we were far away from all other planets, there's no other gravity at all. Do you play, do you play pool at all? Pool like billiards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm good at it. I I thought you might be. (laughs) I'm competitive. Okay, so you take two billiard balls in outer space and put them in front of your face, let's say 12 inches apart and then remove your hands, and because it's in outer space and there's no other gravitational pull, they'll sit right where you left them. And then you watch them, and slowly, 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 they'll start moving towards one another. And the spiritual form of gravity is amazingly that when you are in a state of internal harmony, as I described, you do start serving as a gravitational pull to to things going on in the world. And many of them are customers that show up out of nowhere or a a late paying customer that you virtually written off suddenly sends a check. These things happen when you are in a good state of balance. Yeah, you basically explain what the law of attraction is, right? But you just explain it in a different way. I've never heard of it before. But normally they're just like the law of attraction is you think positive thoughts and then positive things come. But you're... And I'm saying no, thinking one achieves nothing and believing achieves nothing and wishing achieves even less, but doing the things that make a harmonious environment for you, that's what works. That is the secret because people are going to me, why is it that you're attracting things and I'm, li- I'm following your positive thinking and, <laughs> and things aren't happening for me, but you're going, it, it, you really have to embody that whole positive. It's the things you do, doing. not the things you wish or think. Yes, and that vision board, staring at the vision board, isn't going to do anything. It's the. I, I think it. I think it actually robs you of energy. Yeah, 
because you might not, not never get it because you're not doing the right thing and then you're like what's the point of having this and you get depressed and, about it. yeah right well thank you so much rabbi for yeah spending another hour with me going through uh you know amazing content it was so so nice to hear from you and to know how well it, it's going i really appreciate that and uh, thanks for having me back on your wonderful show. Well, thank you so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this interview, I highly recommend you subscribing to my channel so that you don't miss my future episodes with Rabbi Daniel Lappin because I'm going to continue to pick his brain to share with you everything I can learn from him about business and making money the biblical way. If you want to shortcut your learnings, I highly recommend checking out his course, The Financial Prosperity Collection, in the description below. You can use the promo code for a discount. Now, I personally purchased this course myself and I love every bit of it so just so you know I don't get any commission for sharing this either well thank you so much for watching and yeah check out this next video here to help you further on your financial prosperity journey